This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 79, recorded on November 18th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. Good afternoon, Dixon. It's 2.12 here in New York City. It is. It's freezing outside. It's crystal clear, the sun is shining, and it's as cold as you can possibly imagine for this time of the year. I would guess that the temperature is around 23 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to check. And the wind is at uh, 15 miles an hour out of the west. It's exactly zero Celsius. That makes it... 32, 32 Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. It feels like 21, though. But it's not going to get any warmer. What's the wind chill factor? Um... <laughs> Feels like minus six Celsius. Minus six, which is equivalent to. I don't know. <clears throat> I'd have to look it up. It's probably twenty-one degrees Fahrenheit. Minus six <laughs> C in F. Right. Twenty-one point two. Did I? Not? What did you say? Twenty-one. Twenty-one degrees. That's it feels like good. twenty-one degrees outside. That's you must have a lot of experience at. Uh, well, I went to Notre Dame. I went to Notre Dame for my uh, PhD, and it got this cold all the time. In fact, that's what drove us into the laboratory. That's why I got my degree to begin with. <laughs> there was nowhere else to go. It was warm in the lab. Do you like TWIP? No, I love it. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I have a passion for this. I will do this whenever You possible. can, huh? Whenever, whenever you can. possible. Okay. Whenever possible. Now, I've been away, and you have too, so we've, it's been a sort of a lull in the action, as I would say. I'm not traveling anymore this year. Really? I have one more trip. And... Um, Next semester, beginning yes. in January, I teach my course, so my travel will be limited. And what course is that, Vince? Virology. To? Who are you teaching it to? To students. Which ones? <laughs> Undergraduates <laughs> here at Columbia. <laughs> but you also have a course online, though, too, right? Yeah. It's a Corsair course. Yeah, but it's that's over. And, but it's And how many students took that course? I was in two parts. The first part, 35,000, I think, thousand. registered. And the second, tw 18 thousand. or 20,000. Yeah, but they didn't all they finish. all showed up for class at they the same time? They didn't finish it all. Not all of them. Only several thousand finished each several time. Thousand. Well, not you're bad. tough. Come on, you're a tough guy. No, people don't have time to. They have to work. They don't have time to <laughs> they do They never got past the seven different ways of viruses replicating yeah, the genome. Yeah, apparently not. <laughs> now, I look forward to, uh, to um, yeah. teaching again. I enjoy it. You're a good teacher, too. You're not just a good teacher. You're a great teacher. No, I'm okay. No, but I, the subject lends itself to greatness. Well, you could say that, but there are a lot of lousy virology teachers out there, I'm sure, but you're not one of them. You are a great teacher, uh, Vincent. Thank you, Dixon. Trust why, me. Are you, why are you telling me this? Because you are. You want are. something? You want money? You need a loan? Mm, I could use a loan, too, but I know you <laughs> couldn't give it to me, so I wouldn't dare do that for that reason. <laughs> I, would bar I could borrow money and give it to you. You could do that, but that would be wrong I don't also. have a lot of solvency. A solvency? Yeah, but listen to a person who's driving across the bridge yesterday in bad weather, and his car stalls in the middle of the bridge. Yeah, I just started it up again. Just... Turn the key and away it goes. I had to again. lower the podcast because I couldn't hear if the engine was on or not. <laughs> and I learned to podcast. Funny. Yeah, I have a, my car, you start with a button. Right. Mine too. It. it was in very slow traffic, so the fellow behind me didn't notice that I had stopped for That's good. 10 seconds. 10 seconds, right. And a this morning, and this morning it was, though, I'm sure. yeah, because I was hoping it would, I didn't know if it would start again. Exactly, right? Then it's a big exactly, problem. I was exactly. in, be a, I exactly. would make traffic even worse than it was. So don't worry about it. Homeland Security will push you off the bridge. But it, I know uh, they will. <laughs> it started and it, today it didn't happen. Right. But this morning I made an appointment for a service. Good idea. Just to be sure. That's a good idea. Because it's due. Yeah. And I can't open the hood how in the front because it's rusted how shut. How many miles have you got on this car? Are we doing car talk? <laughs> My hood. No, but we should. I can't open the hood. It's rusted shut. We should shut. pay homage to car talk, though, because uh, one of the brothers, the Tapley, by the Tapley brothers, died. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, how Tappet, old was he? Tappet brother. He was in his 70s. But you, you passed him already. Oh, not yeah, yet. Maybe. No, not yet. 
No, he uh, died of a complication from Alzheimer's. I hope you don't die. Well, so do I, but I know that's not going to happen. Eventually, we all do, but... <laughs> I think so. I'd like you to be around another I'll try it my best. I'll years. give it my best shot. Because if you do, I have to cut out then this podcast. It's no, the end no, of no you can continue, but... With you know, who? With who? It wouldn't be the same. No. And you can, there's nobody else it could continue TWIP. I wouldn't do TWIP. So, Unless there's someone out there who thinks they could replace Dixon. <laughs> ah, that's half of the listeners. Come on. I <laughs> know that's true. <laughs> All right, Dixon, we have three yes, things to talk do. about today. We do. We do. We do. And the first is a uh, you have two, two uh, articles that you picked up. I did. I picked them on purpose, though, because... And do you want me to print them so you could see them? No, no. You don't have to do that. I know well, what they One are of them is an Italian, Dixon. I can tell you what they're about, though. That's the point. In, I wanted to raise this as an issue. Infezione Medicina. That's the name of the journal. Yes. Uh, let's see. Free full text. Did you check to see if it's actually in Italian? I did not, but I, I realized, of course, that there is one of us... There are one of us. Oh, there the name of, of the journal is Le Infezione in Medicina. So, infectious. Sito web e rivista di infettivologia medica. Wow, it's, the title is called Vector Transmitted Diseases and Climate Changes in Europe. Right. Now, we've done climate change issues with regards to malaria transmission, but this article discusses other than malaria diseases. It discusses dengue fever. It discusses chicken gunya. You think, because we only have the abstract in English. But it, you know, do you want it, me to translate it to Italian? <laughs> no, I don't want you to do that. But I, I wanted to iterate the fact that for those out there who have skepticism with regards to the reality of climate change, all you have to do is look to nature. Remember, nature has all the answers. What's your question? So the question in this case is, how can I gauge climate change issues by observing nature. And one way to do this is to look at the spread of diseases that are determined by vectors right. which have climate issues. And the vectors that have climate issues are the ones that respond to humidity and temperature and altitude. Mm -hmm. So those are mosquitoes and sand flies and black flies and, and even in some cases ticks. Uh, for all the diseases that are listed here yeah. in this review article, uh, all of the ranges for those vectors have increased, have spread over the last 20 to 25 years, which to them says, now it doesn't say it to everybody, but it would say it to them, yes, climate change is real, and yes, organisms are responding to it, and yes, their ranges are increasing. And because the climate is warmer for a longer period of time, the zone of transmission, the the the, the area of the year that's de designated as a transmission zone, has increased as well. So not only are their altitude and uh, year-long residencies increased, uh, the ability to transmit diseases has increased as well. So that's that's the reason why I wanted to point this out to the. Let me listeners. make a few comments here, please. So they say the increase in temperatures recorded since the mid-19th century is unprecedented in the history of mankind. Unprecedented. Of course, we haven't been recording prior to that, so it's difficult yeah. to know whether it's precedent or there not. There may have been other times when it went up and went back down again. Well, right? it was hard to tell what the temperature was before that, since the thermometers haven't yeah, been Yeah, I understand, but it could have been high. Maybe it's cyclical, Dixon. Maybe it is. That's one interpretation. Vector-borne diseases are transmitted by... Arthropods such as mosquitoes, ticks, triatomines, sand flies, and triatomins. Flies. What is a triatomin? It's a kissing bug. Don't don't get fresh. <laughs> it's a bug that transmits shagas. Triatomin. Yeah. Reduvido. Reduvido. Okay, and then uh, sand flies. Sand flies, which we'll talk about today. We will. And flies. The lutamia Regu and the phlebotamine. Regular flies can transmit uh, infectious disease. What is a regular fly to you? Uh, like the blue bottle fly. The blue bottle. It's a it's a musca. I bet you didn't know I knew what a blue bottle I, fly was. I'm surprised. I'm. I absolutely spent my youth, out. my youth, <laughs> Your youth, slapping blue bottle flies. Did you say youth? Youth. What's that line from? My cousin Vinny. Thank you. I just saw that last night. By the way, the end. You're kidding. And you know, I saw the end. It was adorable, as usual. The big guy, the judge. Yeah. It was fed by Fred 
Winston. He died. He died. He used yeah. to play the Frankenstein in That's Munsters, correct. right? That is correct. I forgot his name, but he said, Ut? What does Ute. that mean? Ute. That's right. Anyway, climate changes in Europe have increased the spread of new vectors, such as Aedes albopictus. Yes. Yeah. That's an Asian tiger mosquito, by the way, which was introduced into Europe the same way it was introduced into the United States. And in some situations have made it possible to sustain autochthonous transmission of sun diseases. Do you know what that means, Vincent? From within. Well, locally. It wasn't imported. It was right. actually... It's like endemic, right? right? It, it could become endemic. That's correct. So autochthonous makes no implications about endemicity. No. It just means right. that at that moment it was transmitted. And they give as an example the outbreak of chikungunya in northern Italy in 2007. Now, what is chikungunya? Come it's on, a, you're the virologist nice, of this it's a group. Nice, uh, it's a nice poultry dish. <laughs> I'll have the chicken gunya and the red wine, thank you. You know, on Twiv, we have not done a chick episode yet. Does red wine go with chicken gunya? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I stay away from the chicken. White wine. That's right. Stay away from the chicken gunya. So what, it, it is a, um, it's an arbovirus. Chicken gunya is not an arbovirus? Well, it's an arthropod-borne virus. That's You're right. That's what, what you meant. That's I'm fine. saying. But the uh, the um, it's not a it's not a member of the flaviviruses, which are arboviruses. But there are other arboviruses which are not flaviviruses, right? I'm going to tell you exactly. I want to know what it belongs Incur- to. You know, inquisitive minds want to know. Do they? Yeah, they, mine does. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a jocular guy. mood today, as you can all tell. All right, well, here we go. I'm going to tell you exactly. Because we haven't seen each other in like three weeks. Oh, that's, the less I see of you, the better. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to edit that out. I'm sorry. No, I'm not <laughs> kidding, you know. Chikungunya is an alpha virus, which is a genus in the Togaviridae. How could you have a genus in a virus? It's yeah. not a species. There are not species there. Yeah, they're classified that you way. No, that's wrong. We did it, we did it on Twiv. You and I, when we used to do no, Twiv just alone, wrong. you and I, it's just when wrong. you were interested. It's When I was interested. We did, a, we did, interested. A, cla- <laughs> we did a classification, <laughs> Twiv. Uh, my okay. feeling about fi- species is that you'd have to define a species in terms of its... Listen to this. Go ahead. Despite the eradication of malaria from Europe, anopheline carriers are uh, still present, and they may yeah. allow transmission if the climactic conditions favor the development of vectors in their contacts with plasmodium carriers. You'd have to reintroduce it. It says, oh, the mosquitoes are still there, yeah. right? Same uh, that's here. not hard. It gets, reintrodu- it gets know, introduced here periodically. Vincent, we have lots of indigenous anopheline mosquito species yeah, we in the don't United ha- We don't have autochthonous malaria, though, right? Sometimes. Yeah. When we was do. the last time? Well, one of them that I recall very vividly was out on Long Island. It was at a Boy Scout camp mm-hmm. in the summer, and someone came home with Plasmodium vivax, which, has, as you know, has a five-year latency period, right? Yeah. So you could have it at any time after that. And one of the people that had came back from a trip probably to East Africa on a mm-hmm. safari came back with Plasmodium vivax. And then in the summer following their return, had an episode of malaria during the summertime. They were bitten by mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes then went on to bite other people, and mm-hmm. they transferred it over to a Boy Scout camp, and some of the Boy Scouts got infected. The other one I remember vividly was in migrant workers re- uh, coming up from Mexico to work in the uh, Imperial Valley of California, in the southern Imperial Valley, and they again, it was Plasmodium vivax, and uh, they transmitted it to people within the United States. Mm. So those were autochthonous cases and, of malaria. And it does not continue because of the winter, right? Correct. But it's in Florida, the best, they don't have a winter in Florida. The best cure for tropical diseases winter. is winter. Why Florida doesn't have malaria? Well, no, I'm not saying they didn't. You'll have to ask Richard Condit that one because he's part of the TWIV team. I think the reason why it's it is malaria. There, malaria. No, because every time we discover a case of malaria, we treat it. We don't let it smolder. We don't let it go out of control. Hmm. So therefore, it doesn't have a chance to build up numbers, and it's a numbers game when it comes to the vector transmission cycle. So something like chick, which is yeah. coming, and but dengue, which is coming. chick is in Florida, and it's in the Bahamas. Yeah, I know, also. but we can't treat it, so that oh, could go un- that's unchecked, right? Yeah, that's different. And you don't have to be hospitalized for the whole time either, we right? We need to do a chick episode on TWIV. You know, uh, we call it chick. That's sort of an abbreviation. I, I would call it chicken, couldn't you? And, and we could get a nice title By for that, By the way, that, what... Right? Is the der- derivation of the word chikungunya? Is it a location? 
I used to know this. <laughs> we used to know a do lot you know, of things. Do you know um, I don't know where it answer. came from? I don't know the answer, but it probably comes from Chikungunya, um, Russia. It's Makonde for that which bends up. Oh. You know what Makonde is? I don't know. It's a language spoken by the Makonde, an ethnic group in southeast Tanzania and northern Mozambique. That's Tanzania. Tanzania. Oh, come on. Don't, Tanzania. don't keep criticizing me. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just I can only to, criticize I'm you. I'm trying to help you. I'm here to help. <laughs> Makonde. All right. The tick, Ixodes ricinus, yes. has expanded. Or ricinus. Is, which one is it? It's either one. It's, it's whatever you like. It's a vector whose expansion has been documented both in latitude and altitude in relation to the temperature increase. And which disease does that transmit? Take a guess. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? No. Lime. Ixodes ricinus? Lime. Uh, Lime. So they've had Lyme disease in Europe for quite a while, actually. The deer tick. Oh, why didn't you say so? Well, why didn't you ask? (laughs) It's a deer tick. (laughs) You would have thought I was flirting with you. The deer tick. No, no. When you said... Kissing. Exodes. No, no. That was the kissing bug. That was different. That's totally different. You're mixing metaphors here. Okay. And now in northern Italy and Germany, the appearance of leishmaniasis has been associated with climatic conditions that favor the development of the vector phlebotomus papatasi, or is it papatasi? That's right. Papatasi. (laughs) Papatasi. So... In the maturation of the parasite within the vector. There's always been leishmaniasis in the Mediterranean basin. Always. Yeah. Right? And it almost got eradicated. about northern Italy and Germany, which is not the basin anymore. This is all true. It almost got eliminated after the Second World War because... I'm sorry. I'm I'm reading. I'm not listening. I know that. Okay. Let's look at my eyes. (laughs) Troop transport. No. No, because of the introduction of DDT, and they thought they could eradicate, eradicate malaria. So they sprayed like crazy throughout Didn't Europe. the American troops do that? They did. And what did they also kill off when they did? Oh, you said this in a recent twip. I did. So you kill off the mosquitoes. Birds? No, no, you kill off, well, eventually, because they aren't in part of the food chain, but you killed off the lutzamaya. Uh, not the lutzamaya, that's a South American bird. You killed off the phlebotamine, the sand flies. So they got rid of malaria and oh, okay. leishmaniasis at the same time. They, they also come uh, back with a vengeance, as they would say. They say that let's not forget. In addition to temperature, there are other variables, right? Like, like travel, migration, yeah, trade. Yeah. You know that moves things around. Of course, it does. All it's right. a good article, as far as the abstract goes. Well, that's now, all we can do because we were, can't do the Italian. The you could Italian. do it. Uh, I, I was could, hoping. Actually, I was hoping against hope that you would give us your best. Um, I can't no. get the article here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Free full text. All right. Where is the... Uh, All right. Let me just... Okay, download. I'm going to try. I'm going to read a little Italian. I, I actually, we want to hear it. I don't you, think you, people want to hear uh, it. No, and I, I want to hear your Italian. Uh, Malati think, transmesse da vettori e cambiamenti climatici in Europa. Yeah. Uh, vector transmitted diseases Vincenzo. and climate changes in Europe. <laughs> L'augmento delle temperature medie... Registrato a partire dalla metà del XIX secolo, non ha precedenti nella storia dell'umanità. Is the music to my ears? Is it? <laughs> L'attuale epoca geologica che fa seguito all'Olcene è chiamata Antropocene per il. All right, it's enough. You know, I could understand some of what you were saying. That's they have pictures of bugs. Nice. Dixon, nice. what is a bug? A bug. A true bug is a hemipteran. Uh, that's right. Not all bugs are true bugs. No, a true bug. They have phlebotomists. By the way, there hemip- was a cover on Science Magazine this week. Nice. This is a nice article. It's, why is it in Italian? See? See? Well, because sometimes it is. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> oh, I can't say that, of You course. know, it would be quite a, a lot of work for me to <laughs> translate this. Now, here's an article you picked, which is in English. Yes. In the New York Times. I picked an article from the New York Times. Now, how dare I do that? Because uh, it's not a period Frankly, article. I'm embarrassed. You are. And of course you are. Furthermore, Until you author, find out where it's from. No, the author is Don McNeil, who I had some issues with, if, if you remember, but no one remembers. It's Wasn't okay. Don McNeil the uh, host for uh, The Breakfast Table on the uh, radio? <laughs> no. Yeah. The, the, the name of this article is, A Rare Form of Malaria is uh, Spreading in Malaysia. Aha. Uh-huh. Dixon, you are the malaria guy. Explain, please. This is nature's revenge, basically. On what? Okay, so the first article we reviewed was on climate change, yes? Yeah. What do you think the causes of climate change are? Human activity. 
Burn- Which kind burning of, of fossil fuels and, primarily. And uh, what else? What's the carbon sink? What? The carbon <laughs> sink? Allow me to repeat myself. <laughs> What's I'll the say carbon the same sink? Thing so you can ask the same question. What is the carbon sink? For, no, no, uh, forget the question. Forget it. I'll ask a different question. What is a carbon sink? A carbon sink is a natural or artificial reservoir that accumulates and stores carbon-containing chemical compounds for an indefinite period. Now, does that help you understand the my process question? by which car- so CO two generation, mm. also methane, right? A little bit. A lot of cows around that I make said a methane. Little bit. No, they make a lot of methane. Yeah, but that's that's not what they mean by the carbon sink because carbon sinks are sequesterers of carbon and it's in the form of carbon monoxide no I'm trying to get you to the answer I was listening I was reading I'm being Socratic (laughs) say it again what is a carbon sink name is something specific not something general uh, what is a carbon sink? Yeah, name. Give me some examples of carbon sinks. Okay, I I got a lot of example. You, you want me to say it in Italian? <laughs> I would love you to say it in Italian. Oceans. And why? Plants. Ah. Landfills. Mm, I wouldn't have put that one in. You know what the sources of carbon are? Yeah. Fires and farmland. And that's all I know. More. Kyoto. Cities. Cities. Seventy percent of the carbon emissions that occur in the world come from cities, from burning fossil fuels. This is all true. Okay. Uh, what is this? What does this have to do with uh, a rare form of malaria? Ah, uh, we'll get to this in okay. a moment. As soon as we take. Are you a break, in your element? We take a break from our sponsor. I don't have I a will, sponsor. I will return in a moment. All right. <laughs> Already, you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so. Vincent, let's talk about a carbon sink, and let's talk about what a carbon sink is. I'm not talking about what a carbon sink does at this point. I'm talking about what is a carbon sink. Name some examples of carbon sinks. And you said the ocean. That's true, because there's a lot of algae in the ocean. Those are plants, and they need CO2 to live, and they absorb a lot of CO2. But they can't absorb all of it. And that's the reason why the oceans are acidifying right now, because they have exceeded the limit for, for sequestration. Mm-hmm. So what well, is another source of carbon sequestration, if you wish to put it in terms of formal terms? Atmosphere, right? Wood? Yeah, and where does that come from? from plants. No, 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 not just plants. These are trees. It's an itty-bitty plant. No, no, from mighty... <laughs> <laughs> from little acorns, mighty uh, oak trees grow. So trees are a major carbon sink. Is and that going to be our title? What are we doing? What are we doing? To what? We're cutting them down. To clear for to make so farmland. What right? is this article about? In Malaysia, it's about a new form of malaria, which is not really new. No, 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 no. The article is about deforestation. Actually, they don't even mention forest. Yes, they do. No. Yes, they do. They're deforesting. They're cutting down as loggers and palm loggers, oil producers. Loggers. Excuse me, uh, loggers? Loggers and palm oil producers. So palm oil is what they plant when they chop the forest down. And they harvest the palm oil, is that right? And then they harvest the palm yeah, oil. So they have pushed deeper into Malaysia's forest. More humans right. have been bitten by mosquitoes carrying uh-huh. plasmodium. Nolzai. Nolzai. I would have That's, said Nolzi. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, as long as you spell it Is right. Is that named after someone? I believe it was. So the normal malaria is what? Falciparum? We don't have normal malaria. Malaria is not normal, but actually, the way you look at it around the world, it probably is. There's Plasmodium falciparum. That's the most numerous, correct? Correct. Then there's Plasmodium vivax. They're both human strains. They are. All of these I'm going to mention are humans. Good. Only. But occasionally primates, but almost never, almost never to the point of being able to transmit it back to people again. Okay, mm-hmm. so... Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, ovale. and Plasmodium malariae. Uh, four. And then Nolzi. There was Plasmodium nolzi. Nolzi. And nolzi was a great model because why? Could you infect a bird? No. A mouse? No. Why was it a great model? Because you could use non-human primates, and some yeah. non-human primates resemble humans very closely, like. 
the macaques and the uh, rhesus, rhesus monkeys. pre nulls eye is normally found only in long and pig-tailed macaques. That's right. And they don't get very sick. They don't. So let's so let's make is, the, the scenario. Do. <laughs> so the the, the um, malaria is in monkeys, non-human primates. Right. And the mosquitoes pick it up, right. transfer it to other right. same species, and then right. if there's a human there, the so, mosquitoes will bite them. Yeah, right. Well, this is a little bit of a conundrum here that I'm having a difficulty with this uh, report, which it turns out to be a report given at the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in New Orleans last month was that some of these malaria-transmitting mosquito species of Anopheles have very specific biting patterns. Yeah. And if this is a deep jungle malaria-transmitting Anopheles mosquito, mm -hmm. the only thing it could ever come in contact with is non-human prim primates. Right. So the moment humans arrive on the scene, why would this mosquito switch its biting habits? Uh you know, we look like a non-human primate, no, I guess. No, we don't. No, we don't. You we do. We don't even smell like you one. You do. So I have a question about this. Which vectors mm -hmm. that transmit Plasmodium nosei were responsible for transmitting it, not to non-human primates, but to pr humans? What was the species? And what are its feeding uh, preferences? All right, so they're Anopheline mosquitoes. Well, they're all Anopheline. Uh, in fact, even though Sir Ronald Ross, and we'll get to this in our letters, won the Nobel Prize for proving that mosquitoes transmit malaria. Mm -hmm. He proved it, transmitting malaria to monkey, uh, to canaries, rather. And canaries, right. the mosquito species that transmits it was a Culex mosquito. Okay. Not an Anopheline mosquito. So is that what we think is involved here? Well, we know it has to be because Anopheline mosquitoes only transmit malaria to primates or non-human primates. It says here, Anopheles leucosphyrus mosquitoes ah. carry P. nosei are found only in Southeast Asia. A rare species of Anopheles. All right, so it says here it's that uh, humans are getting it. It does, so it means that What's maybe biting we, them? What's biting them? Well, it, it's got to be this particular... Anopheles leucosphyrus? I'm afraid so. I thought you said it only bit non-human primates. I didn't say that, but I'm saying that if there are no humans in the area forever oh, yeah, because course. you haven't encroached, right. the only things they're used to feeding on are non-human primates. So why would they turn their biting habits into human primates? Well, I don't think it matters if no, another man, host human primates, human primates, comes primates, in. But, you know, but what you're arguing is that the... Um, why would they switch their biting habits? The hosts are very specific for the mosquitoes. They smell a certain host. We talked about that last we time. We did, right? in fact. The mouse... Odorodent. Odorodentia. <laughs> so That's right. They so, have apparently smelled humans. And so they're here's biting a mosquito them. species. How many that, cases are we talking about? Well, there can't be that many loggers, maybe you hundreds. You think it would be on ProMed mail? It's possible. Yeah. You yeah. know, but this was a report. This was a paper given at a national meeting. So that you wouldn't, ex this is not published yet. And that's the reason why I picked it out of the New York Times. Because you wouldn't have been able to find that online. And yet it was worth mentioning because here's an example of nature's revenge, which is what we're going to call this episode, by the way. Really? So, yeah, sure. You're ordering me to call No, it? I'm not ordering you to do anything. I would only strongly suggest. <laughs> okay. That's fine. You know, a ProMed mail is not so easy to search. Oh, here's a search thing. Let's uh -huh. search. What should... Plasmodium knows I in people. Here. How do you spell knows I? K-N-O-W-L-E-S-I. All right, how do you start the search? You know, enter should start the search. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, look. November 7th. Bingo. Human P. Nolzai malaria. Malaysia. That's the report. Oh, look at this. Go on. The majority of malaria hospitalizations in Malaysia are now caused by a dangerous and potentially deadly parasite once uh. rarely seen in humans, and deforestation is the culprit. Bingo. According to a presentation today at the American Society of Tropical Med Medicine and Hygiene in Louisiana, New Orleans, where they wouldn't let the Ebola researchers come. <laughs> Idiots. I don't... Uh, I don't How could know. a meeting run by infectious no, disease people no, Just because I was that. born there doesn't mean I have to defend it. I'm not telling you because you were born there. It's just it's terrible. I, I agree with you, by the way. Wow. Analysis of malaria patients hospitalized in Malaysian Borneo yeah. in 2013. 68% had P. Nolsey. 68. How many of those are we talking about? 
two. <laughs> they don't give the numbers here. No, they don't. They don't. Why wouldn't they, Dixon? Uh, because it's a report. Because this is a, uh, a preliminary publication. Thing. Once rarely seen in paper, but today in some remote areas of the country, uh, all the indigenous malaria is P. nulzi. So here's the question, Dixon. Yes. Is it going from non-human primate to humans or yes. humans to humans? Well, at some point, if enough people are present in the area, let's say, for instance, you clear out an area of jungle and you plant palms to give palm oil mm -hmm. and you establish a settlement there of people that take care of the palm to make the palm oil, then you might have hundreds of people in the area, okay? So that all of those people would be susceptible to infection from this vector. What would you need in humans to be transmittable? What form of P. nulzi? It's the gametocytes. Gametocytes. Always. So have people looked for gametocytes sure. in people of P. nulzi? Well, I'm sure that's how they make the diagnosis, but they don't just look for the gametocytes, of course. They look for any stage to hey, diagnose look, it. It is well established that P. nulzi produces gametocytes in humans. There you go. <laughs> Bingo. You've answered your own question. Well, I thought you would want to answer it, but no, obviously you do not wish. <laughs> I didn't. I don't have access to the computer like you do. Uh, you know, this helps be smart. <laughs> you know, you can be really dumb and you could be no, smart. No, you're not dumb. You're just wise enough to want to know the outside source of information. All right, so... We really don't have evidence yet for human-to-human -human transmission. Not yet. But if it increases, it probably will happen. Well, and by the way, when you scare off the non-human primates by creating an agricultural setting, yeah. then the only thing left to eat would be us. Dixon, if, if we start to see human-to-human P-nulzi -human transmission via mosquitoes, mm -hmm. does that mean the malaria has mutated? Thursday. <laughs> That's the proper answer for questions that you don't know the answer to. You use a non sequitur answer. The answer is, how would I know? Until you sequence the genome, you wouldn't know. No, no, I think human beings have always been susceptible to infection with P. nulzi. The real issue is ecological. Do humans live in an area of nulzi transmission? And the answer is no, because it's in the deep jungles. But now, because of encroachment... The deep jungle is now accessible. And as the result, more and more human infections are occurring. So the answer We're, is maybe eventually a lot of people will be infected with penile zy. How will we know? You can hospital admits. And so if someone has been in a city and not gone into the forest, then it's right. likely he or she That's got right. it from another right. human, this, right? This is exactly right. But, okay. but, 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 mm -hmm. but there's a big but here. And that is what are the breeding sites? For the uh, primary vector for Plasmodium nullzi. Sorry, say that again. What are the <laughs> what are the breeding prim sites? <laughs> primary breed? Yeah, where do they breed? The mosquitoes. Uh -huh, of course, Anopheles mosquitoes. Where do they breed? They have a variety of choices. Are they tree hole mosquitoes? No, no, no. Those are the eighties. I don't know where the Anopheles Right, breed. but the, some of them prefer clear water. Some prefer dirty water. Some prefer moving water. Some prefer still water. Some prefer mm -hmm. None of them prefer temporary water. None of them. All right? Now, I'm going to say that. What's the definition of temporary water? I'm really wrong when I say that because, like, trio breeding mosquitoes, they prefer temporary water. But How, how long is temporary water around? Less than a week? Is that temporary? Well, they need it longer than that. They need it about two weeks, a week and a half to two weeks. So they breed oh. in old tires because they fill with water when it rains. And then so it the, the length time of time the water is around has to be long enough to support the cycle of the mosquito, this right? This is exactly okay. correct. Some of the mosquito species that transmit malaria breed in the water collected in the hooves of animals that go down to watering holes in East Africa. Because the animals, when they go in the water and they mm -hmm. come back out, they drip the water back up the path and they fill in their hoof prints with the water. It keeps a permanent source of water there. So cattle need water every day as opposed to East African animals like the game animals, which only need water maybe once a week. And sometimes some animals like the Jeronook, they do never drink water. They make all their water from metabolic activity. By they have burning. to drink something. No, they burn fat. They burn fat, just like the kangaroo Dixon, rat. what's the function of water when you ingest it? What's it used for? Everything. Give Everything. me an example. Well, what's the most important thing? It hydrates your cells and keeps them alive. <laughs> <laughs> but the Jeronook, if you look up the Jeronook, you'll find out that it doesn't drink water. 
And you'll look up the kangaroo rat. It doesn't drink water. It doesn't need to drink water. It manufactures fat, and then when it burns the fat, for every gram of fat, you generate 1.1 grams of water in addition to the fat. The um, animals who don't drink water, do they urinate? Like pellets. <laughs> pellets. <laughs> they almost don't. They almost don't urinate, but they do. But it's very. It's really highly concentrated urine. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the jerenek is one of those animals that lives in East Africa that's adapted to life without water, and the uh, kangaroo rat is another one that I'm familiar with. And there are probably many other desert animals that do the same thing. Okay. Alrighty. But most of the animals don't. Like for instance, camels. You know that hump on a camel, mm-hmm. either one or two. That's fat. And when they suck up a lot of water, they also eat a lot of hay. And they convert that to fat, and they store that in their hump. And right. then when they travel over the desert, they, they, uh, they access the fat in their hump, which means they get energy back from the fat, and they get water back, which keeps them hydrated. What are the two kinds of camels? Dromedary and... Bactrian? Bactrian. One or two humps? The Bactrian has two. Dromedaries have one? One. That's okay. correct. I like those names. What are you laughing for? No, I'm not. I'm just amused. About what? Everything. I'm, I'm in a jocular mood today. I told you that already. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. <laughs> okay. Feeling very good. Is, uh, is, that, a, is that it for this? Day? Well, then, no. They would, they, I mean, let's give a bottom line for both of these uh, reports. The first one suggests that global climate change is completely redistributing the vectors that transmit serious diseases throughout Europe. And the second article says that here's an, here's an old disease of primates, non-human primates, that's emerged into humans as the result of deforestation, which contributes to global climate change. Those are the two connectors. Okay? And then we have a third article. Ha! Ah. We have an article suggested by Jesse. Jesse? He wrote Doctor's Twip. Cool. I came across this paper and thought it sounded interesting for a discussion on TWIP. Colonization resistance of the sand in the sand fly gut. Leishmania protects Lutsomia longipalpis from bacterial infection. Okay, Lutsomia is a South American Lutsomia. It's not a um, papatasi. It's a Lutsomia. <laughs> Lutsomia is in South America. What is a Lutsomia? It's a sand fly, just like uh, phlebotomine mm-hmm. flies are. But it's, it's a different genus. But they do the same thing. Isn't that interesting? You know, because this is a little aside, though. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Lutzomia is the sand fly in, the South, in South America that That's transmits correct. Leishmania. Yes. And in, in Africa, what transmits it? I think we already said that. Phlebotomus. So phlebotomus is the name of the old world sand fly. Okay. And Lutzomia is the name of the new world sand fly. So... Let's get something straight here. When did South America and Africa part company? A long time ago. When? <laughs> I don't know when. <laughs> it was during the Jurassic. Jurassic, really? Yeah, it was during the Jurassic. Okay. And these two fly species... You're going to get email. Why? Look it up. You can see. I can already tell you. I've given talks on this already. Yeah, So when Africa separated from South America... Apparently, there was one major group of sandflies. And they evolved into two separate groups as the continents drifted further and further Correct. away from Correct. each other. So that's what you're faced with today. But they both maintained the ability to transmit a disease which was imported Got it. from Africa. So can you give us a brief review of Leishmaniasis in its vector? Sure. So... Lishmania, there are many different forms of Lishmania. Okay, mm. let's start with the simplest form, which is called Lishmania tropica. It's a disease which causes cutaneous Lishmaniasis, mm-hmm. meaning when the sand fly bites you, it introduces not only the salivary secretions, which aids and abets the parasite, it, induce, it in, injects promastigotes of the stage of the parasite, which will eventually transform after it's taken up by macrophages into the amasticote form, meaning that it starts out as a flagellated form and it drops its flagellum and it now rounds up to form a Lishmania Donovani body. 
named after Leishman and Donovan, two Scotsmen who described the same disease from India in separate papers that mm -hmm. was reviewed by Sir Ronald Ross, who was then the chief editor for the British Medical Journal. Okay, so that's where the name comes from. Leishmania donovani and Leishmaniasis comes from Leishman, the Scotsman who okay. discovered it. Okay, so, so the, the promastigote stage lives in the vector after evolving through the gut tract of the vector, and we'll discuss that because that's what this article is about. It then injects its salivary secretions and the promastigotes intradermally because this is a tiny, wimpy, little <laughs> nothing of a fly. This fly can't fly from here to there. It's really a wimpo. But, but, you still encounter it all over the place because, you know, it's where animals hang out because it likes to feed on different kinds of animals. So, so the, the Leishmania is not just a human-human? No, it's to, not. It, it'll feed on other animals like does dogs. Does it go human-human? Human? Yeah, sure. It does, but it also goes from dogs to humans. So there, it can reach enough... It can high enough. So when a when a fly bites you, does it get a blood meal? Oh yeah, and so it gets into your blood, and that's right. That's where it gets the leishmania. That's correct. From and so you that's have to have a high enough number in your blood to you transmit. Do. Well, actually, it doesn't get it exactly it too high? from your blood. Where does it get it from? It gets it from the margin of the lesion that's created for leishmania for cutaneous leishmania. because it doesn't get into your blood. So a fly will go up to a lesion and bite it. Yeah. Well, that's weird, gross. Huh? Isn't that weird? So you have lesions all over, or just a few here. I mean, it and depends there? on how many bite you. Sometimes you can have multiple. So lesions. when a fly bites you, Why you don't get you a lesion. Want? Look at it. Well, we did a podcast on. I this. know we did, but you, it's 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 instructive to go back and do this. Uh, wherever it bites you, you get a lesion. Correct. And you can have multiple bites and multiple. Yeah, and lesions. they're crater form lesions, and, and they're, they're weeping. They're, we had in our episode the young lady with a thing yeah, on her face, that's right? Correct, that's so they correct. can be deforming. Yeah, and leave a scar, and that's a horrible sign that you've been defaced by a disease. So the the scarification came about as a result of not wanting your scar on your face. Where would you like it? I would like it on my buttock, or on the back of my leg, or something, so that no one can see it. So they won't be able to tell whether I've been infected. Or so not. the only way a fly and the picks up is lifelong, by the way. So if you get bitten once, you will not get a scar again. That's correct. From that particular leishmaniasis. Got it. So when a, a fly, uh, another fly comes, the only way it will pick up leishmania is from a lesion. That's right. From not, the margins of the lesion. How not does just it from know? The, I don't know. Does it know I, to get know, near the lesion, or is it random? There may be articles about attractive substances given off by the lesion itself that put okay. the, the flies next That's to it. That's very, it by the margin, huh? I so know, it does not reach weird. a viremic stage. Okay. Yeah, if you look to see where the active infection is, it's right at the margin of the lesion. It's on the crater rim of the crater of the lesion. Last time we talked about leishmaniasis in South Sudan, I think. We did. Remember? Yes. And we we're do. talking about Kala Azar. Kala Azar, that's the worst kind. That's Lishmania Donovani, named after those two Scotsmen. That's right. So so let's go back to the simplest form. So Lishmania cutane uh, cutaneous Lishmaniasis is caused by Lishmania tropica, and in the New World, by Lishmania mexicana, mm -hmm. or Lishma Lishmania peruviensis, or Lishmania venezuelensis, or Lishmania. There are multiple forms of Lishmania in the New World which have strain specificities for the region in which they're transmitted. Mm -hmm. And they're mostly animal transmission, so they're zoonotic. And every encroachment results in a brand new form of this disease. So Philip Marsden uh, was a champion for uh, in South America for actually uh, making known the fact that there are many, many, many different uh, subspecies of Lishmania, cutaneous Mexicana type, which will infect you. Some of them give worse lesions than others, and they can be told apart by their pathogenicity as well as their location of transmission. Okay, So there might be 30 different, or maybe even more than that now, of New World cutaneous leishmaniasis. That's one form. That's transmitted by Lutzomaya in the New World and by uh, Phlebotomus in the Old World. Now, for the second kind... Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the kind that makes you sick? These are all going to make you sick. Okay. So the second kind, we'll go to the New World first and talk about Leishmania brasiliensis. This is called mucocutaneous mm -hmm. leishmaniasis. These are 
horrible, disfiguring infections. They erode the soft palate. They start out as a lesion that looks exactly like the cutaneous form. Then the cutaneous lesion disappears, even earlier than ordinary for the cutaneous form. And you say, okay, I'm cured. And the next thing you know, you start to, the nasal septum starts to disappear. And the palate, your soft palate starts to disappear. And it's awful. And it's also at mucocutaneous junctions like your urogenital tract and your the anal area of your body. And you can develop these horrible necrotizing lesions and that's mm -hmm. just an ugly disease. The worst form of it is called espundia, which is an entire erosion of not only the nasal passages, but also the soft palate. And an, an enormous open gaping wound uh, shows through the face. And you wonder, how can someone go that long without seeing a medical uh, center for help? And the answer is, there's no medicine in the tropics for, most, for the most part, in the rural parts. Mm -hmm. That may have changed a little bit, but not so much. So um, Brasiliensis is a horrible form of this infection. And then, there, of course, there's a Cala Azar. So Lushmania Donovani, which is caused by Lushmania. And that's present both in the New World and in the Old World. It's mostly in the Old World, and it's 80% lethal if you don't treat it. 80% lethal. That's a huge in lethality rate, all right, for cases. So that's really bad. That's a bad form. And it's, it goes into the visceral. So it's called visceral leishmaniasis. Right. All right, so you've got three different kinds. Then you've got these quasi <laughs> I didn't say crazy. I said quasi. Yeah, I know. Quasi, why? Quasi. For instance, when the United States participated in Operation Desert Storm, yeah. Okay, the troops went into the Middle East, which is an endemic zone for Lishmania tropica. Now, people living in the Middle East would get the tropical cutaneous lesion. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened in this case. The U.S. troops got a visceralizing form. They were in a strange host with a strange immune system with a strange pattern. And the next thing you know, I'm watching a, um, I know what that is. The it's hawk? A, yeah. No, it's not Falcon. A hawk. It's a, I can tell you the name of this one in a moment. It's the fastest one on the planet. It goes over 200 miles an hour when it dives for its prey. It's called, and it breeds in very high places. You don't know the cliffs. name? I'm blocking on the this The red-tailed falcon? No, 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 no. It's not a falcon. It's a... Uh, a feschrift. Oh, feschrift is a German... Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm blocking. Why am I blocking on the name of this? You're going to edit this all out? No, I'm not. People need uh, to know how spaced out you are. I'm not spaced out right now, but I am blocking on the name of this... this uh, Give me a clue. Raptor. No, you'll know the Is name it a raptor? This. Yeah, of course. Why don't I search for fastest raptor? Oh, well, you'll get it right away then. It's a... Um, oh. This is a senior moment. I used to... Peregrine know, falcon. A peregrine falcon. Didn't I say that before? Peregrine, no, you didn't say peregrine. Peregrine falcon is the fastest. Fastest Goes over bird on record. Ah. Wins races, huh? Oh, for sure. <laughs> if you're a pigeon, you're going to lose that one. So um, back to Lishmaniasis. So Lishmaniasis not only is characteristic for the lesions that they cause, but the lesions vary with the hosts that they infect. Mm -hmm. So endemic populations get one kind of lesion, and invading or, or um, uh, non-autochthonous cases that, it, that actually come into the endemic area and catch it, they develop totally different diseases. How were the troops treated? Well, they were all treated with sodium stiboglucanate, mm -hmm. which is a antimony. It's a heavy metal com compound which actually cures the disease, but it also gives you lots of side effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and by the way, six hundred thousand people lost the ability to donate blood, and that's a big deal for the army because there's a lot of trauma in warfare, and uh, there's a great need for blood, and they usually take blood from troops. And in this case, 600,000 of them no longer could donate blood because they've had this visceralizing form of leishmaniasis. Okay, so that's the background for the biology of this infection. Okay, so the biology of the infection that's little or poorly understood, I should say, takes place in the vector itself. Because the vectors are tiny and they're tough to raise in vitro, you know, in laboratory situations. and. And so we're just finding out about some of the interactions that occur between the vector, the parasite, and 
And now you have this wonderful and to add to everything that's out there and their microbiome. Right. So Lutz, so these Lutzamaya has a microbiome. It does. It's a small one. It's a small <laughs> microbiome. <laughs> they but mention it's, that it's small. Because it's a tiny fly. So. It's a tiny little fly. But nonetheless, it's an important microbiome because it could, it could affect the outcome of their ability to transmit leishmaniasis mm -hmm. or their ability to even live. Because there are some bacterial species, like for instance, they mentioned serratia marcescens, could be proving lethal to both the parasite and the host. So they'd like to know the relationship between Leishmania and the microbiome in the gut. Yeah. Because the Leishmania develop in the gut of the fly, this right? This is all true. So they're ingested. That's what right. form is ingested? The amasticote. Okay, and then in, in the gut, what happens in the gut? Well, in the gut, the macrophage is digested away, okay? Mm -hmm. And the amasticote then transforms into the metacyclic form, which, by the way, it has to stay in the gut tract of the sand fly. So how does it do that? Yeah, because things are moving out, right? Yeah, that's right. Does so it hold a, on? There's a lectin. Yes. This thing actually attaches to, just like your viruses. It's just, but it stays there, and right? it's a sugar. Gut? And it sticks onto the sugar, and mm. it doesn't move until it transforms to the next stage. And as it does so, it detaches from this portion of the gut tract, and it moves down the gut tract to the mm -hmm. next portion, which has a different lectin, which it then attaches to. How do I know this? Well, <laughs> that's a good question, twip. actually. How do I know this? From TWIP. I, no, I remember a, a gentleman who used to work at Columbia, in matter, as a matter of fact, for Elvin Cabot, who is one of our old-time heroes for immunochemistry and loved lectins and sugars of various kinds. And this guy's name was uh, Mercio Pereira. And Mercio Pereira worked on lectins because he was from South America. Hmm. He was from Brazil. So Brazil, this is a big deal in Brazil, all right? So he wanted to know a lot about lectin bindings of various parasites. And in fact, he studied uh, leishmaniasis for a while as well. And he sh studied Chagas disease also, which migrates down the gut tract of the Reduvid bug. So here you have two similar things. But, but eventually, of course, leishmania has to get into the salivary glands. Mm. Because it has to be transmitted through the bite right. of the mosquito. Doesn't want to be excreted the, in the feces. Of the right. sand fly. Of course not. Yeah. That was very good, Vincent. You remember that the Reduvid bug yeah, it does that. doesn't give it to you by biting, right. it gives it to you by defecating on you. So so here we have a study of sand flies and their gut microbiome in relationship to their ability to maintain infections with Leishmania. Who would like to know? The interaction. That's right. Is there, any, is there a relationship? In fact, one of the questions is, is there any benefit to the fly of having Leishmania in it? Could Why would they ever want to do this? Because it, 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 it actually uses resources that the fly needs for its own biology. Well, if it, right. And so there may be That's right. a benefit to the so fly. So should we read just the abstract from the background, the methods, the results, and the conclusions, and then go into the paper? No, or would no. you like to do Let's the paper? Let's just go right into the paper. Let's just go right into the paper. Yeah, we don't need no stinking abstract. We don't. <laughs> Who would have said that, do you think? <laughs> Eli Wallach. I don't Eli know. What? He used to say things like no, that? No, he said, we don't need your stinking. So what are they doing? The first experiments, Dixon. Yeah. They feed the fly... Various yes. microbes. They feed them a yeast, huh. which is called pseudozyma. I've never heard of that. Pseudozyma. Is and a bacterium it? called Asaya, uh -huh. <laughs> which is an alpha proteobacterium. Right. And also another bacterium called O intermedium. Ah. Uh. Which, and these things, by the way, they have isolated from, they grow these flies. They have a colony and they have isolated these. So these are presumably part of the normal gut microbiota. Right, or microbiome. Would you call a fly an animal? Of course. Would it you ain't call, no plant. Would you call a starfish an animal? But of course. Really? You bet. Okay. Would you call a book an animal? <laughs> Only if I was drunk. <laughs> okay. So they feed, and you can't feed these flies very much, you know, <laughs> very <Well>, small volume. <laughs> they're very small, that's true. But they feed them one of these uh, microbes, and then they feed them... Leishmania in a blood. blood in a blood meal. That's right, rabbit blood. So they infect a rabbit and then they take the blood. That's right. 
Well, I thought you said it didn't get into the blood. Dixon. Well, they seeded it with parasites. Do you notice it says rabbit blood seeded? No, it's mixed. With well, so that it will induce the so fly to take it So rabbit blood, and then they mix them with the. And that will make the fly drink it. You can culture it. these in vitro, by the way. You can culture the um, the promastigotes in vitro. You can imitate the gut tract of the sand fly by using a special medium called Schneider's medium, hmm. and you grow it at room temperature. Because right. they're insects and they respond to room temperature okay. the best. Okay. So they feed these microbes and they wait, I think, 72 hours. They feed them Leishmania and they wait some more. And then they count the pro-mastigotes in the gut. So, Dixon, to do that, will they have to dissect the fly open? They will. And take the gut tract and then they take it. How do you, you just cut it open? Laborious. How do you count them? Can you see them? Sure. Well, under a microscope. It sounds very laborious. How do you know you've got them all out? <laughs> well, you have to ask them that question. I guess they've got their methods worked out pretty well. Or maybe they rinse them out with a little, uh, a few microliters of PBS. Uh, anyway, they count them, and they have this graph showing that right. when you give them the yeast or the yep. bacteria, it decreases the number of promastigotes in the gut tract. You can also do it by quantitative PCR, it says. Yeah, they, they're actually looking at... Uh, the number of promastigotes. Right. So what do you think? Are you impressed by the effect? There's a big effect, right? Yes. It I, clearly decreases the number. So this says that the bacteria and, my, and fungi can prevent colonization by Leishmania. This is all true. So it, wait a minute. So and, well, and they also show that if you look for infected flies, there's a, only the o Ocrobacterium bacteria will decrease it. The others don't. So... <sighs> Tell me what you think of this, Dixon. Well, does yeah, this... And, and you only need 800 or less bacteria to do this. So they must occupy the same receptors that the Lishmania... I don't know about you, but I've attach. never been to hotel receptor. <laughs> really? You the same, the, the same niche? No, that's not necessarily the explanation. I mean, it could be. It could be that they produce something that's inhibitory to uh, It also could be that they, emit, they secrete the receptor, and that would prevent them from attaching in that way. That's true. It also doesn't work with killed, heat-killed bacteria, ah. okay? So they have to be alive. Ah. So that suggests And it's not just the, in the, the supernatant of the medium in which you grow these things isn't enough. You and need that the also actual bacteria. Well, and that further defines the issue. But, Dixon, I don't understand this yes. experiment because we know that Leishmania can colonize these flies and be That's transmitted. True. So That's what does true. this mean? It means nothing, right? <laughs> so far. At least as far I mean, as you've taken this data. All it means is if you add more of the bacteria that are already in the gut, you can inhibit the successful colonization by Leishmania. So I have a question that would originally... Uh, arise by simply not knowing anything about these uh, flies, and that is, are laboratory reared fly microbiomes the same as wild type microbiomes? Because mm -hmm. these are laboratory strains. Yeah, they may not be. And you feed them to find yeah, diets. Exactly. And the next thing you know, you've got uh, a change in the microbiome. Well, they actually say that they're raised in an aseptic environment, but yeah. they're not germ free. No. In fact, they did some sequencing to characterize. Their microbiome, and they say they have a low level. Right. I think they have 10,000 bacteria in each one. Total. Total. Exactly. <laughs> that, well, they're tiny little guys. They're really tiny. They are. Right? Yes. And they didn't want to eliminate them with antibiotics. But they could have. They could have, but they said it might affect, it, it would have inhibit Leishmania. It would have been a so different experiment. It would have been a different experiment, yeah. Right. Germ-free insects you can buy, but they that it would be different, you know, Correct. so we leave in. All right, so that's part one. You give them certain microbes that can inhibit Leishmania. So it inhibits the establishment. Maybe in nature there are some flies that have a different microbiome, yeah, yeah. and those are resistant so to it, colonization. It suggests a possible control mechanism, doesn't it? So could we release flies with a specific yeah, inhibitory right. microbiome? Or set out traps <laughs> for them to feed on in which these bacteria were enriched so they would acquire them yeah but maybe Either, it would make a maybe it would give them a fitness cost that would not yeah, allow them to know, do anything it, and to then bite maybe people they would maybe. lose it after they got them you don't know yeah. anything about that so it's it's a, it's really risky stuff but interesting to note nonetheless that there are some differences in Lutzomia with and without their microbiome. They mention here that the mechanisms of colonization resistance, which is what we've just discussed, yes. are likely to be multifaceted, including direct bacteria-mediated lysis of Leishmania, 
Wow. Competition for binding sites as yeah, your hotel receptor. Right. <laughs> and nutrients <laughs> were indirect via immune priming. So bacteria are known to prime the immune response, so that and could be Insects have a good immune system. They do? They do. It's all mostly cellular-based. Yeah, it's RNAi. It's RNA-based. And it's RNAi-based. Yeah, interfering RNA, yeah. That's interesting. For sure. No antibodies. No. No antibodies at all. No. But they do have amoebocytes that actually scavenge and kill things. So they have a phagocytic system as well. Now, the next part here, Dixon, they ask, or could leishmania be beneficial to the fly? A big stretch. You think? Is it a normal inhabitant of sand flies? And the answer is no. No, but they make the point that they have to inhabit for enough time to be able to develop and move down the tract and be retransmitted. So they have to play some tricks. Uh Because let's say leishmania in a fly was detrimental. Well, those flies would never get to bite another host. That'd be the end of leishmania. So you can see how you would select for evolution of a beneficial or at least neutral leishmania, right? This is true. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Or is this going over your head? No, it's going under my head. You're you're, you're actually (laughs) dumbing this thing down for me, but you don't have to do that. Not dummy. It's I'm, about I'm, as complex as I can explain. It. <laughs> well, that I know. <laughs> I'm just talking in evolutionary terms. There has well, to I be some you. kind of negotiation because if the leishmania really messes up the fly, it won't transmit it. There's a, an energy price to pay for the harboring of another organism. Always. That's so why we call them parasites, right? Does that offer right? an advantage? Well, we're going to see. another way. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, I got a leishmania. <laughs> All right. So in this Keep experiment, reading. they first infect... With the fly with leishmania, and then they give them bacteria. Right. Okay? Yes. And they use serratia marcescens, marcescens right. which... You know what the color of that it's is? It's red. It is. I know it? that, because I used to grow it when I was a kid, and I knew it was red. And it's, it could give you a cold. Really? Yeah, it's not a, it's not a neutral organism. Now, when they do this... Okay? Go on. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> if you so the order is you give them leishmania then you give them bacteria right. and when when you do that um no this is not making any sense to me wait where's the figure is you up to number 2 now no thing number 4 oh so serratia is lethal right in, that's in what these they guys think. both for the parasite and for the fly yeah so basically when you give them leishmania first you prevent lethality. You, you do reduce lethality. But serratia marcescens isn't one of those ordinary contaminants of their environment, I don't think, is it? Well, let's ask. Let, that's a good question. Um, we use the insect bacterial pathogen serratia, which is known to be associated with wild sand flies, and it's also lethal to them. So it's known to be in wild flies, Dixon. Whether it kills them or not, I don't know, but it's certainly in these experiments it did. So if you if you okay. give flies, okay. um, so they have colony collapse syndrome and sand flies. <laughs> serratia due to serratia? kills them. Yeah, just serratia alone kills them. You could look at this curve. That's very interesting. You give them a blood meal with serratia in it, they die. They're almost all dead within six days. No, I see that. But if you give them a blood meal alone with sucrose, they're, they're you know forty percent of them are dead in right. six days. I right. guess flies die normally over time, right? They don't live of forever. Course. No, flies don't. Because I was looking at this curve and it's going down with nothing. And so <laughs> right, we're the control. <laughs> your experiments are dying. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, if you give them leishmania, you prevent uh, lethality. Yeah, Not six days, fifty percent of. Yeah, it's like dead. about fifty percent compared to ten yes, percent. That's right. So there's an effect, right, Dixon? Yes. And this effect actually is is not only achievable with bacteria, but also with the culture media from the bacteria. Indeed. You don't have to have a living bacteria, Dixon. Uh, And in both cases, um, the numbers of the bacteria and the leishmania are the same. Right. They're not changed. So that's, that's interesting. All right, so leishmania is protecting the fly from serratia killing. That's right. the message from this experiment. Which is a normal pathogen. I'm sorry, I just misspoke. The number of leishmania is the same, but the number of serratia go down when you put leishmania in compared to the sucrose control. Okay, so it outcompetes the serratia. Wait. There was a significant reduction in the population of naturally occurring sand fly 
gut bacteria in Leishmania-infected sand flies that had been exposed to a daily serratia or oral challenge. So the, the microbiome is decreased, but there were no differences in serratia population in surviving or so uh, maybe it hyped up flies. the resistance to lethality without uh, getting rid of the serratia. But it's affecting the microbiome. So it Leishmania is. can affect the microbiome. Yes. So basically they would have died. Right. Without the Leishmania. So it could have some protective effect so in the let's wild. let's go to the conclusions then. Because I thought you were going to say, let's go to the videotape. <laughs> no, we don't have videotape. Conclusions are uh, pre-feeding yeast or bacteria to sandfly can prevent establishment of Leishmania within the sandfly. Okay. And sandflies infected with Leishmania can survive an otherwise lethal attack with a bacterial pathogen. Right. Here's something I found really interesting. Yes. So they mentioned that people are thinking about biological control uh, of sandfly vectors, right? Using pathogens. And they say, any new form of control aimed at insect vectors must consider the ecology of the relationship. Because ecology. what if you use an insect vector and, and, and some pathogen, and that, that wouldn't kill the Leishmania-infected flies because we've shown that they're protected, and you're only killing the wild-type flies. That'll enhance the number of infected flies and increase disease incidence, possibly. Do you know what I'm saying, Dixon? Mm, or do you want me to lower it a little? No, 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 no. I hear what you're saying there, <laughs> Vincent. And I wonder what percentage in na nature of is amazing. infected sandfly versus not infected sandflies are. You don't know? No, I don't know if it's not even. I, I'm sure it is. You just don't know it. I know the no, percentage of people who have viruses out there. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. That's not <laughs> that's right. fair. That's totally not fair. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So for Leishmania infected sandflies versus normal sandflies, like for instance, in malaria, yeah. for plasmodium infected Anopheles mosquitoes, it's usually about 1%. So 99 mosquitoes out of 100. You know how many bats are infected with Ebola virus? <laughs> Every one of them. No, no, it's just a few percent. I don't know the answer to that. I'm telling you, I know. I've read the papers. Oh. It's only a few percent. Read the papers now, have you? <laughs> only a few percent. So how well, can people be infected when they eat one only and a few they percent? start the infection in people, and after that, the rest is history. Well, there's, an, there's a belief that there are periods yeah. when more bats have it for whatever yeah. reason, you know. Interesting. Um, there can be environmental influences. Like when... You know, when the rain is good, you get a lot of pignon nuts, you get a lot of mice, and you get hantavirus infection. That's right. You know, that sort of thing. I understand that. Did you like that paper? I love it. Should we thank Jesse for suggesting yeah, it? You betcha. Jesse, by the way, does his own podcast, you nice. know. It's called so. Bacteriophiles. Interesting. Yeah, Jesse is a graduate student in microbiology. Wow. He has thank you, Jesse. a bright future. We appreciate it. All right, let, let's do a few emails. And Great. I mean a few because we only have a few. Go for it. They've died. Because we don't <laughs> podcast enough, it's fine. You, you, come on. What? <laughs> we, do, we do our best. Jesper writes, Professors, thank you for your continued effort in sharing your knowledge and scientific enthusiasm. It is always a pleasure to listen to the Twix shows, and I have learned a lot from them all. I just ran into an interesting article on how T. Gondi may change the behavior of its human host. Right. You might find it worth reading. Um, this is the paper that we asked John Boothroyd <laughs> right, about. Right, right, right. How your cat is making you crazy. And he, he no, was very John skeptical. John sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, I really can't believe that it would have that much of an effect on people because, in essence, what it really does is change the ability of a mouse to smell a cat. Right. It takes away the mouse's ability to smell cat urine. Why would that affect human behavior and the answer is it, it wouldn't unless you have a lot of cats in your house and then you don't really care because you can't smell them but I think it wouldn't have much of other other kinds of effects on people's behavior so John you yeah know, John Boothroyd it doesn't mean he's it, right yeah. it just means that he, as a yeah. world expert on uh, Toxicara or Toxoplasma rather he has a right to an opinion because he's done a lot of work in the area and he's listened to a lot of presentations and in his opinion he doesn't think, because of its high degree of prevalence, mm -hmm. especially in France, for instance, where almost everybody's infected. Well, everyone's crazy, right? So that You might, know, that if might... you say that on the air, Vincent, you're <laughs> going to get a lot of mail, and I'm not going to be responsible for that we one. We don't have French listeners. At all. <laughs> You'll find out. Yeah, we do. 
You're going to find out. Kidding. You I'm will find kidding. out. Americans are more crazy Sock than French. Sacre blue. Um, go back to the John Booth word twit. Yeah, sure. Do you know yeah, which one right. that is? It's, well, you can find it pretty easy. Just type his name out on our twit how, index. D- Dixon, how would you find the number of the John Booth word twip X episode? It would be very me. easy. I'd go to the search mode for twip and type out Boothroyd, and I bet you get it. It's back in the 19... It's back in the 50s, I think, in the 50s. Free-range toxoplasma with John Boothroyd. What a great title. What number? 45. 45 close. I said Hey, 50. Dixon, this is number 79. I know. When we do 100, why don't we eat raw meat? Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> John on, and we can serve steak, steak tartare and have a party. On a side note, it seems Twip does not have a Facebook presence. Unless that depends on my poor searching ability, you may want to consider rectifying that. Jasper. Now, we have a TWIV page. I'm not making a TWIP because Dixon won't do it. He doesn't do Facebook, and I can't do it. I have enough on my plate. <laughs> and after all, it's Dixon that has to be running it because he's the parastologist. I'm not a big fan of um, social media, Well, that's just because just you don't not. know what it means. That's probably right. You don't even... If that's you've not been there, how would you know? Well, that's true. Well, we're doing a social thing right now. That we're, we're Next one is from Simon. Dear professors, yes. first I would like to share with you an attached photograph I was in London a few weeks ago waiting to meet a friend in Cavendish Square, which is right next door to the Royal Society of Medicine. Yeah, it's a great place. In order to kill time, I was walking around the square, and I noticed a blue plaque on a nearby house. (laughs) They're quite common in London, denoting places of historic interest. Right. As soon as I saw it, I knew I had to take a picture to send in to you, particularly (laughs) as recently been listening to the series of episodes of Malaria from the early days of TWIP. Hey, this is a great picture. <laughs> I showed it to Dixon uh, before um, we we um, started recording. It's a picture of this nice bl- blue plaque. Yep. Sir Ronald Ross, Nobel laureate, discoverer of the mosquito transmission of malaria, How lived here. He lived there. He lived there. Shouldn't you worship this, Dixon? Worship, but I, I deeply revere it. We'll put this in the show notes. You know, I lived in Manhattan um, as a graduate student on 90... 90- Fourth and First Avenue, oh, yeah. and across the street was a factory. All right, and on the third floor of the factory, there was a plaque which I could see. It said, "Lou Gehrig was born here." I'll be darned. And so there was at one time a house there, but many years later, I went back to look for it, and someone had stolen it. Someone had stolen Somebody it. Stole it she was. Anyway, secondly, in a free moment, I was browsing the PLOS website the other day. I neglected. Tropical Diseases has to be my favorite journal name. <laughs> Came across the following paper. Diverse host-seeking behaviors of skin-penetrating nematodes. Right. Whoa. Hey, maybe we should do this. Okay. Look at this. Skin-penetrating parasitic nematodes. Yeah, so like hookworm and strongyloides, for instance. They, they tried to find the odorants that are driving they did. them. It's, it's, um, it's an acid it's, it's like uh, the one we did for mosquitoes. No, it's not the same things. No, no, no. It's uh, we it's found a, that Strucoralis, Strongyloides Strucoralis, is attracted to human skin and sweat odorants, including right. many that attract mosquitoes. Yes. We co- compared olfactory behavior across parasitic worm species. Found that parasites with similar hosts respond similarly to odorants, even when they are not closely related, huh. suggesting that worms use olfactory cues to select hosts. You bet. So this is. Well, I reviewed an article for cool. PNAS uh, that suggested there's a specific acid in uh, sweat. Didn't you? Uh, yeah, we did that paper. Remember? Yeah. That was for worms. I call too, them right? chemical trails that parasites follow. Right, and we are the name of that is no Happy acid. Trails to You. That was our Happy Trails to You. You I, forgot, didn't you? I, of course, I didn't. Um, uh, I'm blocking on the name of the acid right now, though. It's a. It's like canoic or cannabinoic or. Come on, help me out here. <laughs> Since I don't have my computer in front of me, that's not fair. You've got a brain in, uh, advantage. Well, look. Um, and the name of the acid you should, is... You should have brought it. Well, it Eurocanic. was out of charge. Eurocanic. It was out of charge. Otherwise, I would Trip have... Trip 71. Bingo. Simon. Bingo. Yeah. Interesting, the data su- seem to suggest the key role of olfaction in nematode host identification. And this reminded me of your discussion on TWIP 78 of odor detection and right. by mosquitoes. The right, fact sure, that sure. both mosquitoes as carriers of malaria and these skin-penetrating nematodes 
have evolved sensitive olfactory responses led me to wonder if this is a very common host detection strategy among free living moving parasites. Do you know of any other examples? Thank yeah, it's you. just the some sicarii. Well, the one we just mentioned, this TWIP 71, happy trails to you. What was right. that? Strongyloides. Yeah, uric acid. What's the other one that you know of? Well, there, there was one. Uh, they don't exactly know what the substance is. They thought it was lanolin for a while. Uh, that that comes off as an oily uh, secretion of the skin for uh, sicaria mm-hmm. for the uh, schistosome infections, but I don't think they identified the actual substance. Okay, and that's how they find each other too. By the way, I mean they they not only uh, pick our scent up, but they also find each other that way mm-hmm. as well. So there are pheromones that they secrete. So they have a well well evolved um, uh, nervous system. It's tied into uh, small molecular weight chemicals of various sorts that uh, it really allows them to survive quite nicely out there. All right. Fascinating area of biology. Thank you, Simon. Yes. Anne Marie writes Yes. I went to Belize this summer. That's a lovely place. And noticed the attached sign at a roadside tamale place. <laughs> I thought you two might appreciate seeing it. I don't know if you guys speak Spanish, so I thought I'd translate it the best I can. So it's basically a calendar. With some graphic on the top I showed you, right? You did. For a community free of leishmaniasis, these are Ah. diseases caused by a parasite called leishmania that transmits to humans through sand fly bites. That's right. So this is the El Mexicana. This would be the El Mexicana. Wear a thick long sleeve shirt, thick pants, a hat with a wide brim, and work boots in the forest or jungle. (laughs) Keep your house clean, ordered, and free of trash and weeds. Just like your house, Dixon. Keep (laughs) animals, including dogs and cats, out of the house in clean, secure places. Right. Use fine mesh mosquito nets daily. Cover yourself after dark. And yeah, cover good luck chil- with all that. If you live in the rural areas of that country, you won't know. You cover won't do any children of that. after 5 p.m. Yeah. Go to the nearest health service. Treatment is free. True. But remember, once you recover from that, you won't get it again. Also, my dad got ehrlichiosis while orienteering in Maryland. Right. He felt cruddy for a long time, but had no lingering ill effects. That's a rickettsia, as I recall. He's also been bitten by a rattlesnake. I guess when you orienteer, you get lots of these things. <laughs> what do you get or- ehrlichiosis from? Ticks. Ehrlichia. That's right. Exodes. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Did you, did you say thank you, Dixon? I, thank you, Anne-Marie. Abe writes, hi, I just started binge listening to all the episodes of Twiv and Twip. <laughs> ah, I love it from the beginning. These are great. <laughs> As an interested scientist in a completely different field, I wanted to ask, Twip, are there any examples yet of archaea, mm. archaea yeah. acting as parasites to hosts in the other kingdoms? Not that I know of. I haven't heard what of it. My what ear you know? is what not would you to know? the rail. You're not to the rail, yeah. <laughs> so I don't get the early signs that we've discovered something new. Because there are bacteria, of course, that are symbionts and parasites, right? There are. Are there biochemical reasons why it would be impossible? We don't know. They have weird genomes, that's for sure. Archaea have absolutely, and they're extremophiles for the most part, so... It would be found in places where hosts probably would not frequent. Like, hmm. you know, thermal vents and... I'm just seeing here that uh, there are no examples of archaeal pathogens or parasites. Right. But we're not asking that. We want to know if they parasitize someone Other else. Other life forms, that's right. Several species of archaea are involved in symbiotic or parasitic associations with representatives of eukaryotes and bacteria. Nice. Including methanogens. Huh. You know what? Since we've only explored 2% of the bottom of the ocean, and we don't know much about life on Earth other than that, <clears throat> even though we think we do, I think the, the spectrum of relationships is still wide open, and we shouldn't suggest for the moment that we know anything about the answer to that kind of question because I think it's broadly based and rightly so and eventually someone might discover some relationships that do fall into that category. Well, this is an article here from 2011 which outlines quite a few of them. Ha. Huh. Associations. Well, okay. I'm not Associations, sure. yes. But not, not necessarily um, Intracellular. So he's probably thinking of Archaea being inside another host, right? 
We have them inside us. They're yeah, well, symbiotic in our gut. I'm thinking about Wolbachia, but that's not a archaea. No, but the, the methanogens in their gut are archaea, and are they? They're they're symbiotic with us. What right? are they doing there? Making methane. <laughs> yes, but what, why does that benefit us? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know offhand. There there are probably metabolic benefits, or other. Maybe they help break down some of the fibrous material. Anyway, I'm going to put this article in the show notes. You can good idea. You can look at that. Yeah, right. Which I just found on uh, searching. Right. But also there was another article here. Anyway, it's called Archaeal Symbionts and Parasites," huh. but not them being parasitic. Right. Um, the why, you want to know why they're in our gut, right? I would like to know. Yeah, Do, I don't, I does don't. every single species of microbial life in our gut play a positive role in our life? You know, since we have so many of them. Uh, they aid digestion, it says here. Yeah, well, you know, that's a pretty generic. It is pretty generic. That's flippant. Flippant. <laughs> All right, the next email is from Chelsea, who writes, Hi, Vincent and Dixon. I hope this email finds you both well. I'm a big TWIP fan. Great. The podcast is fantastic for getting good science across in an entertaining way. I'm even assigning several of your episodes to students in my Ecology of Human Parasites course nice, at nice, the University nice. of Michigan. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, we'll tell, tell Kathy Spindler to get in touch with her. Why? Because she's at the University of Michigan. And yeah, she's but what is she going to do? For TWIV. What is she going to do? Say hello. Just go down the hall and say hello, <laughs> you know? You never know what you might learn if you make a connection like that. I'm attaching info on an opportunity for early career scientists to present their work on ecosystems within organisms, any aspect nice. of ecology and evolution uh, of the microbiome. The early, this early career scientist symposium will be held at the University of Michigan in late March. Many of your listeners may be excellent candidates. Absolutely. So I would be very grateful if you could mention the call for nominations on your next episode. Keep up the great work. Okay. Thank you. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Good and deal. Christoph writes, I saw this article and thought it would interest Dixon, assuming he <laughs> hadn't <Vincent>. seen, it, <laughs> seen it already. It's okay. I'm not insulted. I can handle it. <laughs> now, this is a summary in Ars Technica by John Timmer, who I know. I, I talked to him. I don't know if you could say I know him. Go on. About um, how mosquitoes are attracted oh. to humans okay. via their scents. Okay. And um, it's based on a Nature paper, which came out recently. And the, the senior author is Leslie Vosshall, who's at the Rockefeller University. And I've been oh. trying to get her on TWIP. Well. I emailed her. We're ready. And she said, I have a backlog of email. I'll get in touch. So <laughs> this article, Christoph, is very interesting, and I would like Dixon and I to speak with Leslie, Dr. Valsall, about it. Maybe we should go it. over and have lunch with her. She was day. a postdoc with Richard Axel. Maybe we should go over and have lunch with her. What's with the lunch? What's with the no, eating thing? No, because then we can find out whether or not there's enough there for a podcast or not. There's plenty there. I haven't been over to Rockefeller in a long there's time. There's plenty. You and I are going to go to her office and do it there, but she's got to agree. Yeah. To a time. The last one is from Stephen, who writes, Dear Professors Racaniello and De Pommier, I have two corrections for you. Uh oh. First, in episode uh -oh. two, Professor De Pommier named Darwin's bulldog as Aldous Huxley. No, no, no. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean it. It's not Aldous. The correct Huxley is Thomas Henry That's Huxley. A, yeah, 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 I didn't Aldous mean was a much more recent philosopher yeah, and writer of fiction. Uh, mea culpa, mea culpa. You actually were corrected by someone else, Dixon. <laughs> yeah, by you. <laughs> Second, in episode 17, uh -oh. Entamoeba Histolytica, oh, which dear. I'm only halfway through, polar ice melt and consequent sea level rises were mentioned. Professor de Pommier's explanation for the difference in effect of melting at the North and South Poles was not really right. Uh oh. The real difference is that ice at the North Pole is almost all floating sea ice, Correct. so it's already displacing a mass of water. Did I say that? Equivalent to the mass of the ice. I thought Thus, I said when that. the ice melts, it will have no net effect, ignoring the warming minute. of the water, which would result in some thermal expansion. I thought I had said that. The Antarctic ice, however, is most sitting on the top Correct. of the vast landmass that is on the continent of Antarctica, so right. when it melts, there will be water and plenty of it added to the ocean well, what ecosystem. Did I say? Whatever you said, it was wrong, oh, man. I, no, no, I knew that. Well, 
He's correcting you. Well, you think I, he would make it up? I have He's a listener. Culpa. I have mea culpa on that, so I don't total mea culpa. We'll go back and one. listen. I'm going to do that because I would never. Episode 17. Under any circumstances, suggest otherwise that the North Pole's ice cap was anything else but floating sea ice. Okay. So yeah. if it melts, I got hey. it, Dixon. I came to TWIP via TWIV, which I started listening to during the height of Ebola news coverage this year. Uh, Good, welcome. Last week, I also added TWIM. I'm slowly working my way through the back catalog. All the podcasts have me feeling vague pangs of regret at having <laughs> left science after graduating. Oh, dear. Thank you for making great shows that are accessible, entertaining, and educational. And sometimes wrong. At the same time. <laughs> Yeah, we are sometimes wrong. <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know what? You can't be right all the time. Come on. You really can't. So we, we pay homage today in a special But you're footnote. wrong most of the time. Stop it. <laughs> so we're going to pay a footnote. We're going to pay a footnote uh, homage to uh, one of the uh, Tappet brothers who passed away yeah. about three weeks, maybe four weeks ago now. One of the Car Talk guys, because... We have been occasionally likened to some kind of a scientific version of Car Talk, which we're not, because Car Talk had much more variety on it and uh, still does. I mean, the archives that, that they play on uh, NPR uh, are clear about that. They have quizzes. They have live call-ins. Uh, they discuss real issues of how to fix your car. And they were, they were usually right, although they weren't always right. Uh, but... One of the brothers developed Alzheimer's disease and uh, died of complications of it. And it was a very sad show to listen to the NPR version of his brother paying homage to his dead brother mm -hmm. by playing the most hysterical laughing episodes that they ever had. <laughs> he used to and laugh a lot, right? His brother laughed ad nauseum. He just laughed and laughed and laughed. He was a joyful person. And his absence will sadden all of us by... The fact that we can no longer enjoy that spontaneously anymore. Yeah. We'll have to listen to all the reruns. And they, they were on the air for 25 years. That's the other difference. <laughs> Dixon, can you imagine after, being on the air for 25 years? Vincent? After we're gone, maybe they can air reruns of TWIP. 25 years, though? I mean, God, no, God, nobody since, wants to hear it. So, huh? how long have we been on for TWIV? I started TWIV with you, Dixon. You did? In 2004? Yeah, in 2008. It's been five years. So it's only been five. We got twenty more to go on that. Six one. years. Wait, what is this? Two thousand and fourteen. Yeah, it's two thousand and fourteen. Six years. Three hundred episodes. It seems like a long fifty time. a year. <laughs> <laughs> Just churn them seems out like year forever. in year out. <laughs> I know. Well, you quit after the first few weeks. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Went to India. I. On you announced it on the show. I come whenever I can. When do you? Uh, what do you want to call this episode? We're not always wrong or right. No, no, no. What was my other? Uh, nature's revenge. Yeah. But that doesn't have anything to do with the... Uh, revenge of the trees. With the reduvids, not reduvids, the sand flies. No, but it has something to do with malaria and the... Well, we'll uh, talk after we stop recording. Right. Dixon, where can you find TWIP? On iTunes. Where else? You can find it on Microbe TV. No, microbeworld.org okay, slash microbeworld TWIP. Someday there will be a microbe TV, but not okay. yet. Okay. And if you have comments or questions, what should they do with it? They them? should write you. At what? Directly. <laughs> Vincent <laughs> Racaniello at V. <laughs> Rack at <laughs> Columbia. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> Twip at twiv.tv. Twip. Why are you so silly? Uh, because I'm in a good mood today. Why? I have no explanation whatsoever for that. I can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just feeling... Mary. You can find Dixon yes. at trichinella.org. That's relevant to this That's true. podcast, right? That is true. And medicalecology.com. You can do that. Neither of which have been updated in years. No, but they're still valid, though, because they have a lot of good information. They're valid, still. and I have taken them over. You have. Nominally. You I haven't done haven't anything. haven't done anything on them. We don't, you want me to do Nor something? have we. Do you want something done? Yeah, of course I do. Well, let's finish your other website first. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Or at urbanag.org. WS. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today, Dixon. Oh, Vincent, it's always a pleasure. Or should I thank myself for joining you? I don't know which <laughs> No, no, way. it's a pleasure when we get together. Let's just put it that way. This was fun. This was fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws, where I write about viruses. You do. You should do a parasite blog. Maybe.
and every week you could write an article. You know, I... I know, it's too much work, but you know no, what, it's Dixon? it's not a work thing. It's not a work thing. You know a lot of stuff. No, here's the and deal. And you could do here's it. Here's the deal. It, I already told you this once, and it's an Einstein story, and everybody has their own Einstein stories, and I love this Einstein story because it, it, apparently this happened, uh, whereas a lot of other Einstein stories didn't happen. But mm-hmm. it, apparently he didn't start to speak until the age of three. Why is that? Well, that's what his parents wanted to know. When he started to speak, hmm. they asked him, Albert, what took you so long to speak? <laughs> yes. And he said, well, I've never had anything to say except for now. <laughs> you have plenty to say. You just don't, no, you it's just don't want said, to do it. You no, know, it's been said before. It's oh, tiring. You could pick an outbreak and write about it. Explain it. You well, go into ProMed and you can find a new outbreak. We have an outbreak of T. P. P. Nolzai. Of P. Nolzai. P. Nolzai. So you should write a blog post. Forget it. I'm not going to convince you. Thank you. you. Don't, don't, it's don't, fine. Please but, don't sidle me with that job. What, you have other things to do, like fish? I do. No, 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 it's too late. It's just, uh, this is not the season anymore. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is parasitic. parasitic.